his multilingual module madness, which I invite you to say several times fast in a row. Uh, and I certainly won't do that right now. So that's the official slide. Um, I want to say hi to everybody and whichever language you would like. I cannot speak all these languages, but um, I can say hi and ciao and hola. themselves a Drupal veteran. You've been doing Drupal maybe for, I don't know, three years, two years, more? Oh, mercy. Why are you here? All right. This was a, this is a beginner talk. Maybe you haven't done multilingual. So of those folks, hopefully you haven't done multilingual, or at least not in Drupal 7. Um, doors back there if, if you're in the wrong place. Uh, who would consider themselves a newbie? So less than two years. Less than a year. Uh, is this your first DrupalCon? All right. Oh, nice. All right. Welcome. Uh, who's on the builder side? Developer? You put the sites together. Oh, most of you. All right. And themer. Any themers? Oh, got a little bit. Project management, business side of things. Oh, a little bit. All right. Uh, and who here speaks more than one language? just the way it goes. Uh, and maybe some of you do everything. You build the site, you're the project manager, you're the themer, you're the, 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 I'm sure there's a few of those out there too. All right. So if you're building a site in Drupal and you have this great site out there um, and the customer loves it, your company loves it, whoever you're building the site for, and everyone's happy, and then the next day, they say, hey, let's add Spanish. And I don't know if you noticed here, maybe not so happy. Uh, so you, you think, OK, I haven't done that. But you know, it's Drupal. I know how to do Drupal. So it, maybe it's not too bad. We'll see. So the first thing to do is don't panic. That's number one. Since you're here, you'll be able to be very calm about it. But you need to understand that it is actually not a simple thing. So some things in Drupal are simple, and some things in Drupal are not. And this falls into the latter category. So you might think, OK, well, I've got this site. Well, how long is it going to take to add, you know, add multilingual to my Drupal site? It really depends on the complexity of your site. So uh, I've played with some sites that needed some multilingual, and they were simple sites, and you know, just easy to add a few things, and we're done, right? But I've also worked on some sites that the sites were very complex. They may have had images with text in them. Not recommended, but you can do it. Um, things like that, or just complex workflows, you know, with the you know translation team and external translation companies or whatever, and lots of stuff going on, a lot of moving parts. And then, you know, it could take two months, right, just to focus on your multilingual part. It could take longer. It really depends on your site. So what modules should you use? So obviously, this is the multilingual module madness talk, so we're going to talk about modules. Uh, and that's sort of the focus. But um, it's a little tricky because you're going to go and you're going to try to decide what modules to go install, and it really, it depends, right? It depends on your site, depends on the site functionality, depends on what you need to have multilingual for, because you might have images, and they don't 
have text in them, so you don't need to worry about that part. You might be using panels, and you have panel pages, and you need to worry about making those multilingual. Or, you know, you might be using views. You could probably be using views, but, you know, you have to decide at what level do you need um, to have that kind of multilingual support. So if you go over to Drupal.org and look for modules, you might think, oh, I'm just going to go to Drupal.org, and I'm going to search, and there's going to be the multilingual module, right? I'm going to go there, and I'm going to download it and install it and press the button, and I'm good, right? That's what you're hoping. It's like the magic multilingual module. But in reality, you go there, you look for multilingual, press search, and you're like, oh, maybe kind of crazy. Yeah. So there's actually over 100 modules on Drupal.org that are marked multilingual. And actually, there are more than what you see here because some um, packages or projects on Drupal.org are actually a collection of modules. So you'll find that the um, internationalization um, project is actually a bunch of modules in it, all these submodules, and, you know, you'll probably use one of those. So, you know, there's quite a lot. So as a preview, here's some of the modules and, you know, kind of weighted by how frequently they're used. So you have all these modules to choose from, you haven't done multilingual before, and you're like, I don't know where to start. So first off, you need to kind of get a big picture of what's on your site and, you know, basically the, the anatomy of your Drupal site. So here's an example. I didn't build this site, but um, I gave this talk at the Stanford Drupal camp, so I threw up some Stanford pages, you know. Um, and here's just a very simple example of a, a Drupal site. This is for the Department of Physics. And it's got all the standard things. You've got, you know, you've got your logo and your menus and your images and blocks and nodes and layouts and so forth. Um, you know, they're using views and, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if they're using panels, but, you know, they've got a lot of, a lot of moving parts because you can do all these great things in Drupal. So you have to decide, well, first off, you're going to need to just look at your site and see what's there. And then for all the different things, decide what you are actually going to translate, um, and you're going to have to categorize that stuff. So in, in the multilingual Drupal world, there are kind of these buckets that we can kind of think about when we're talking about what modules we care about. And um, they fall into roughly a, a UI bucket, which we'll talk about, a content bucket, and a config bucket. Now, the config bucket really should be like 100 times bigger than the others. But, um, and that is, that's super variable, that config bucket, because it just depends on what you're using on your site. You know, if you're using panels, then you care about that. If you're not, you don't. So that config bucket is, is quite, um, you know, quite variable. So what you'll do is you're going to look at your site and you're going to put your things into these buckets to figure out what modules that are going to help you make your site multilingual. So first off, we'll talk about the UI bucket. So in, and this is a little bit different, you know, so the concept of these, this UI area in multilingual is a little different than just UI in general. So keep that in mind when you're when you're thinking about multilingual Drupal. For Drupal, the UI um, is really about some text that's coming from a module or a theme, or basically code somewhere in your file system, and it's wrapped around Or if it's in your installer, they have, there's some other functions that are similar to that. So basically, if you pass in, if you're a module developer or a themer, and you want to be able to make some string in your site that you've defined in code, you want to be able to translate that down the road. Or you might want to translate that down the road. You should wrap it in this T function. And what that does is it lets the Drupal 
system know that this text is available for translation. You don't have to translate it, but it's there, right? It basically registers with the system and it says that, okay, yeah, we can translate this. So that's the, the UI bucket. So an example of that, there's a, you know, the user module that you use, you know, everyone uses on the Drupal site, and here's an example of a, a login page. So some UI text would be the, you know, the page title, you know, any tab labels, field labels and descriptions, and text for buttons. Okay, so these are very simple examples of text coming from a module in this case, and then we could go in if we decided we want, instead of to use login on that tab, if we wanted to say sign in, then we could do that, right? We could, we could translate those things with that, because they've been registered with that team. So, kind of in general, you know, one simple way to go in and translate that type of text in Drupal is that you have um, you have a screen, which is a, a translate interface screen um, on your site, and you can just type in the text that you want to translate. It's case sensitive, so that gets people um, usually at the beginning. You have to make sure it's exactly like you see it. Um, so, one side note is if you're using CSS on your site and you see stuff all caps, it isn't necessarily all caps, right? So, you need to actually get look at the source because, you know, you can do all sorts of fun things with CSS. So, that sometimes fights people too because they're like, oh, yeah, it's all caps. It doesn't work that way. So, make sure it's really the text that's coming from Drupal. And then you can search for um, whether you're looking for text that has been translated, hasn't been translated, both, and filter for results, and then it'll just show you whether um, you have a translation or not. And you can edit it if you have one already. You could because you, you've gotten it from um, from Drupal. I'll explain that in a minute. But um, then you can change the translation if you like, or if there isn't a translation yet, you can provide one. So. The key modules when you're when you're talking about the UI, first off, you need the locale module. So the locale module you just need in general to add languages. So you enable that, you can add your languages to your site, and then that gives you a way of um, doing the that screen I just showed where you can change, you know, translate particular UI text. Now to make your life much much easier you really should install localization update. What that does is instead of having to manually say, oh, I'm using the views module, and the, some nice people have already translated some of the UI strings in views for me. I'm using German, and some people have already translated that stuff. I don't have to do it. I just need to go and grab the information and suck it into the system. Um, if you don't use localization update, you have to manually grab those translation files, import them into the system, and this pain. So you don't want to do that. So what you want to do is definitely install localization update. If you do that, then it just gives you a page you click on, and you go for coffee because it takes a while to suck all the strings over, and it's grabbing everything from localize.drupal.org, and it knows what modules you have, and it gets all the core stuff. And it says, okay, I'm going to go grab this stuff, and we're all good. And then the nice thing is you can set it up to say uh, it updates on the clock, right? So I want to update it daily. I want to update it weekly. So if there's new translations coming in, you don't need to worry about it. You just it happens. So that's a must. Localization client is a great module. Um, that one, it's a nice to have. It, you don't have to have it, but it is handy. So if you have an on-site um, translator who's you know, going to be navigating the site and looking for stuff that needs to be translated, this is just a handy tool. It'll give a little toolbar on the bottom of the page, and it only shows you UI text from that page. So um, it's not like the little search that we did earlier where you can just find anything in the whole system. It just focuses on that particular page. So that's a nice to have. Um, it's, if you're going to be sending stuff off to a third-party translation service, then this wouldn't be necessary. Now, 
Now, another module, which is very handy, but is, um, it's not strictly for multilingual, but you can use it for multilingual, is string overrides. And the nice thing about that is like a situation where you wanted to call login, sign in. Um, if you just had an English site and you wanted to do that, you could use the string overrides module and do that very easily. So it's, it's a really nice helper module, uh, whether using multilingual. Enough, uh, I did put, so you don't have to write down all these modules, the slides will be up, but and you, you don't need to find out what links, you know, how you find these modules. I just added a quick page on my Kristen on work site, so you can go there and it'll have links off to all the modules, so it's really easy. So that's what the, that URL is at the bottom. Okay, so that's the UI text interview. So we have a few modules we can use in order to deal with We've already just you know, talked about four modules, and we're only talking about the UI text, which is very specific things just coming from these T functions in, in the code. So now we have this content file. So for that one, you know, what, what is content in Drupal 7? In Drupal 6, it was really notes, right, and post and book. So um, now there's more going on. Now that we have entities, we've got nodes, we've got comments and users, taxonomy terms, custom entities. So really, in the, at least in the multilingual sense, um, we treat entities as content in Drupal 7. So I have a little star next to taxonomy terms because taxonomy terms is actually kind of a strange beast. You can treat taxonomy terms as content in Drupal 7 for translation, or you can actually treat it as configuration. There are different modules you would use depending on which way you go. So here's, you know, a typical node page, nothing very exciting. It's just it's got a title. In this case, it has a, a simple image, and it has some body text. So how, how would you go about translating something? Well, if you install the right modules, then configure it, configure it the right way, you'll, you'll end up with a translate tab on the page. And then you'll have a list of all the languages that you have on the site, and you can add a translation or you can edit the translation. So it's, it's pretty simple. Um, and then you, you make sure you, that you need to select the language that the content is actually in. That's if you're adding the first, the first one. If you go from the translate page, then it knows because you said I'm adding a translation for German or, or whatever. Um, and save your content. So the tricky thing about Drupal 7 is that there are two very distinct ways of translating content. And it makes things kind of tricky because in Drupal 6 and before, there was one way to do it. In Drupal 7, there are two ways. In Drupal 8, we're going back to one way, which is different than the other. So we're, ha we're at this kind of crossover point, which can make Drupal 7 multilingual kind of confusing. So the two different ways um, of doing, and, and, the, and the two ways this really applies to nodes. So for nodes, there's a node translation method, and there's a field translation method. I'll talk a little bit about those two. Now, for all other entities, you just have the field translation me method, so it's fine. It's not a big deal. You're good. Um, you can just focus on that. But for the node translation, you actually have two different ways of doing things. So it can be a little bit confusing. So the thing about node translation in Drupal 7, and, so, and this was the method that was used for Drupal 6 and before, is have a node and you want to translate it, so you copy the node, right? Makes sense. It's simple. Copy the node. It's in a new language. You change whatever you want, and it just knows that relationship between um, itself and the, the source, you know, the, the main, um, the original content that you, you were translating. So in this case, we've got, you know, a German node, and it was translated into Polish, and it was translated into English. So in this case, the, the you know, default language of the site is probably German. And then there's another node that was created in English that doesn't have a translation. So that's how the node translation 
model was. So the other method is this field translation. And in that method, you use one node, and you actually decide what fields on that content type are translated. So it's just a very different approach. Um, and so people that are familiar with doing multilingual in, you know, six and before, all of a sudden they've added this new way of doing things, and you, you know, have to wrap your head around that and how, you know, does this make, which one would I choose and what makes sense? And really, which one you choose depends on your site. Um, if you were upgrading from a Drupal 6 site and you were trying to do a really straight upgrade and make things as simple as possible, I would probably go with the node translation just because it would make your life easier than you should try to get all of those multiple nodes back into one. I think that might be kind of a nightmare to do. Um, and there are other reasons you might actually prefer having it so that there are multiple nodes. If for some reason you needed to flag, in, you wanted to flag based on language. So you wanted to say, oh, this French node, I need to flag it for something. And this, you know, German node. Um, whereas on the other side, if you wanted to make sure that you were capturing all that information in one place, you weren't losing anything, then, you know, you'd want to do the field translation method. And if you're starting from scratch and doing Drupal 7, I recommend the field translation method because this is the way of the future. Um, and that, that way you'll be good going forward and the upgrade path will hopefully be the same. Well, you should be able to upgrade from the other method too in Drupal 8, but I think it'll be safer to, to go this way. So, for node translation modules, the key ones are the core content translation module. And that one, so that one's in core. You just turn it on, and that's good to go. And then if you have certain fields that you don't want translated, because maybe it's an image and you don't want it translated, and you're not going to translate it, you can use the synchronized translations module, and that'll keep the fields between the nodes the same. So when you see on the slides where I have the I-18N, what that means is that's part of the internationalization package or project because there are a suite of modules under there. So um, you would actually download that whole project and it's a sub-module under there. As far as the field translation modules, you end up using something called entity translation. And that's kind of an interesting, it's a contrib module, but a lot of the core people work on it. It was, they wanted to get it into core for Drupal 7, and it didn't happen. So um, it became a contrib module, but it's, it's supported by a lot of the core folks, and that is going into core for Drupal 8. So you'll definitely need that. And a strange beast that you need is the title line. And the reason is because there's this field API in Drupal 7, which is very cool and is based on the CCK stuff from Drupal 6 and before. And title is actually not a field, okay? And so it ends up causing an issue with translation because if we're doing translation based on fields and title isn't a field, then how do we translate the title? So tr the title module is a workaround for that. What it's, you know, it's a clean hack, you know, so you install that. And then what happens is when you go to your Manage Fields page, you'll see a little button that you can replace the, prop the title property, they call it, with a field. So you replace it for that content type, and then all of a sudden now you actually do have a title field, and you can translate it. So you will need that module if you're using entity translation. Okay, so we talked a bit about the UI bucket and the content bucket. So the config, config bucket, like I said, is kind of huge, and it really is very, very site-dependent. I mean, 
I mean, typically all sites are going to want to translate UI text and they're going to want to translate content. I mean, that's sort of the point, right? But on the config side, it just, it's really variable on what you might want to, to translate. So, menus. So that's, you know, obvious thing that you would want to be able to translate. Blocks, possibly. Taxonomy terms, again, that's the one that said, like, well, I couldn't translate it as an entity because taxonomy terms are entities in Drupal 7, or I can translate it in a different way, um, more of a configuration. Views, you know, the URLs themselves. Variables, okay. So variables are a little interesting. Um, if you're not a developer, coder, you probably don't even know about the variables that are used um, in Drupal. But basically, there's a big variable table in Drupal, which will be going away in Drupal 8. Woo um, and in there, if you have a module and it has settings, it's going to store stuff in the variable table because it needs to keep track of stuff, right? So a very simple example is uh, the system module or one of the Drupal core modules. You can go to the site information page and um, you know specify like the the home URL, right? The home page URL. That's something that's pretty common for people to go do. You decide you want to have a view as the home page or whatever. You go to the site information page and change the, the home URL. Um, so that actually is stored as a variable. So what if you wanted to be able to have a different home page for language? You need to be able to tr translate or configure the variables for the different languages. Uh, panels, if you're using it, uh, any SEO kind of things, you know, in Path, Path Auto and XML sitemap, that kind of stuff. So basically, anything on your site that's not UI text and not content falls into this big config bucket. So here's just a very simple use page, and it's got, you know, just showing an image, which you may or may not want translated, and a title, which you probably would want translated. So for views, uh, if you wanted to show content that was different based on language, then you can configure the view, and you specify what language, you know, that you want it to check the, the current user's language. And it's actually quite simple to do that. But there's also other stuff about a view that you might have. Maybe you have header text, uh, the little more links, uh, pager text, things like that, footer text. So there's also a way to trans basically be able to translate all those little bits of information that is user entered, I mean, a developer entered usually, right? but we might want to have that stuff translated too. So in that case, you, you go to your view admin page, you know, if you configure the right modules, you've got a translate tab in there, and just like if you're translating content, you end up with this little table that says what languages you have, and you can add your translation. You know, then you'll have this list of all of the text that you have for the view that you can translate. So it's pretty straightforward. So what modules would, might you use if you're doing, um, configuring your, your site for translation? The transliteration module is something that you could use whether you're doing a multilingual site or not. And what that one will do will make sure that your file strings and your URLs don't have weird characters in them, right? It just kind of cleans things up. You don't have funky, um, you know, weird spaces and characters and um, things that might cause problems on certain browsers. So that one's good to have no matter what. Menu translation. So obviously if you're doing, if you're translating any of your menus, that, then you would want the menu translation module. Again, the IATNet is for the internationalization package. Block languages, if you want to translate blocks. Taxonomy translation, if you want to translate your taxonomy terms using this configuration approach rather than the entity translation approach. And 
a little caveat there is right now, or as of a few months ago, I would actually go with this approach. Uh, I did try to go the entity translation route with taxonomy terms maybe six months ago-ish, and um, I ran into a problem. Now maybe it's all fixed, but, um, you know, or you could try it. I mean, I was try. I like entity translation. It's the way of the future. You want to try to use it if you can. But I ran into a problem with um, the views integration. So there was the taxonomy terms in a uh, view filter, and it wasn't working when I used it in the, tra the, taxon the entity translation in the taxonomy terms. Once I switch switched over to using um, the internationalization module method, then it actually worked. So, you know, you're going to need to test it, things and try out different options sometimes. Okay, so path translation is kind of interesting. Um, if you have two pages on your site, now this, normally you wouldn't use this for, for node pages because that's handled already with the content translation process. But say you had two views and the two views were totally different. You just decided in Spanish, I want something crazy like this and in English, I want something crazy like this. And you know, it's not the same view, they're totally different. The path translation module actually lets you point those guys to each other and say, oh, in English it's this, in Spanish it's this, you know, it, this is a pair, and just treat it like the translation. So it's very handy, handy if you're using panel pages or views or maybe custom pages um, that you've defined in code or whatever. Contact translation is if you're using the built-in core contact form, which, a little side note, Entity forms is pretty cool for that instead. Um, variable translation, we talked about that a little bit before. That's if you wanted to maybe have a different logo on, you know, the Spanish side versus the English side, right? Maybe you have some text in your logo and you want to be able to have different text. Uh, or if you have a different site slogan or whatever, or there's a module that has variables and they're in the variable table and you want to be able to translate them. And then internationalization views will let you deal with views, obviously. Um, that, one, that project actually used to be under the internationalization, you know, package as another sub-module. But what happened was views changes a lot, and it's a moving target. So they pulled that out as a separate project so that they could try to keep in sync with views better. And really, it just depends on your site, right? So if you got panels, there's some, you know, helper modules for that, different ways you can do things. Um, if you're doing SEO stuff, you know, like the Path of Auto already has built-in support for multilingual. So it really just depends on how your site's configured, what modules that you'll have to work with. So kind of another bucket that I didn't really talk about is, you know, this is a way to configure your site to be able to deal with UI text, deal with content, and deal with all this configuration. Um, but someone needs to be able to actually translate this stuff, right? And it might be someone on the site. It might be a third-party translation service. Um, you might use machine translation, an auto-translator, not really recommended, but if you're testing stuff out, you know, that's, that's an option. So um, here are some other modules that can help just you know, make things a little easier for the person that's dealing with all of these translations. Okay, so if you have on-site translation um, folks and maybe all of those people are actually English speakers, but maybe they're copy-pasting in, hopefully not, but, you know, copy-pasting in translations from other languages. They don't know the language, right? They're English speaking, they're American, and, you know, they... They're like, okay, I need to paste all this German stuff. Oh, I don't know. So the admin administration language module will let all of the, the outer text, right, all the UI text on, a, on an admin page be in whatever language they want. And then so they can understand, like, oh, I'm pasting in for this field or that field. So it's, it's a helper module for that. Translation table is just a really quick and dirty place where you can go and, like, translate terms and menu items. It's pretty simple and straightforward. The 
overview table just, it really is an overview. It gives you a sense of um, how many nodes have been translated and just gives you a big picture of, you know, where you're at, like what, what's missing. But the most exciting one, in my opinion, really is, um, it's a fairly new tool. They started it a little over a year ago in Zurich, and it's the translation management tool. And it's a whole framework that has a API and everything that um, you can do. You set it up on your site, and then you can plug in third-party translation systems. Or if you're just doing translation on the site, uh, you can use the local um, service, right? So you can just have it, but it gives you a workflow. You can send stuff off to translation and get stuff back. And, you know, it integrates with, with a number of things. So some of the things it integrates with, um, super text and, um, oh, I'll have Bing. I think Bing was on there. Um, you know, Google, Gango, that kind of thing. So it's a really great framework. And I know the Lingo Tech guys are here, and they're, they're thinking about plugging into this as well. They have their own system um, as well. But um, it's just a nice unified framework that if you're working just in Drupal and you want to have a nice way of interacting with um, translations, you know, text and getting it to the right people and getting it translating and knowing who's in charge and having translation roles and that kind of thing, notifications, and then that's super tech. So I know Lingotech's in the house, and uh, actually got a, a little private demo yesterday of their of their stuff. And so they have kind of a, a little bit interesting model because they work with with companies that actually have lots of different types of sites, not just Drupal. So they might have all these enterprise systems, and they all need to have translation. So it's it's a it's a little harder to wrap your head around that because you want to have one centralized place where you can you know, unify the interface for all of these systems if you need to do this. Uh, CloudWords, I think he's in the house too. I'm going to be meeting him soon. Um, but they have a system which actually plugs in. They don't do translation, but they plug, they let, allow you to, to tap into third-party translation services. And one-hour translation is one of the vendors. All right. So, what's ha so that's all Drupal 7, right? There's a lot going on, and there are a lot more, more modules I have not even touched upon. If you go to the Kristen.org, there's some pages that you can see a whole laundry list of, of modules. Um, and so, the good thing is things are getting much simpler. So, in Drupal 8, there's a whole number of initiatives. I'm sure you've heard about them all. Maybe some of you were sprinting this last weekend or on Monday, hopefully. And um, one of the major initiatives, and Dries talked about it if you made it to his keynote or watched watch the, the recording, is the DA demo. So um, I've been fortunate enough to help out a little bit on that project. A lot of people have been spending a huge amount of, of time and effort on this project. And if you want to find out more about what that project's about, there's a Drupal 8 multimedia button on it to find out. So what's what's going to get better? Lots of stuff. And Dries actually did a you know quick demo of some of, of the great things that are happening. Um, for example, it used to be that if you wanted a Spanish site and that's all you wanted, you had to actually install Drupal in English. So just Drupal 7, right? Install in English. Go figure out where you add the language of Spanish, and then you know make that the default. You know, see, you know, you have to jump through some hoops. And now you just in the installer, you just say, "I want Spanish," you know, and it just even disables the English for you. It just assumes, okay, you just want Spanish. We can go from there. So, um, if anyone's still interested in multilingual after this talk, I hope you are. Uh, there's a talk at one o'clock um, by um, Gabor. He's going um, to talk all about, he'll, he'll be demoing all the cool stuff in Drupal 8. There are sprints on Friday and this weekend if you're interested in helping out with Drupal 8, and they have meetings um, every week or every other week in IRC. So if, if you are interested in helping, and hopefully you are, uh, if you go to that website, they're just there. Are, if you're brand new to Drupal, you can still help. And if you're not a coder, you can still help. We had um, an awesome guy that I 
ran into at, at the hotel who was from Holland. He's like, I'm a project manager. I can't help. I said, yes, you can help. He came to the sprints on Sunday and Monday, and he was finding issues and finding issues and reporting them and saying, oh, this doesn't make sense, and finding usability things. I mean, it was awesome. So he, you know, he probably put in like six issues, right? And that's valuable. So we need people to test things. We need to be people that think about things. So you don't have to be a coder in order to do that. So if you want to learn more about uh, multilingual, there are some Drupal groups, internationalization and translations. So there's a forum on translations. If uh, there were a fair number of you that raised your hand that, you know, you know more than one language, uh, help out with translations. That's a way to contribute back to the community. Is you just say, oh, okay, well, there's a few strings that haven't been translated. I can go do that. That's easy. It's my native language or whatever. And then on IRC, there's a channel for that. There's some docs on Drupal.org, some handbooks. And actually, we're in the process now of revamping that section so that we'll have a Drupal 8 uh, multilingual section. And we're going to try to make things nice and clean and also, there's some websites, and actually, I wrote a book on Drupal 7 Multilingual, which you can get from this thing. All right. So, the, the takeaways really are that you need to know it's not simple, right? So, have some patience and just be prepared. Don't think that, you know, you've got this huge site, oh, I'll just throw a multilingual and, you know, I'll be done in a day. So, just, you know, plan accordingly. And, you know, don't give up. There's, a, you know, stuff on the forums, and if you get stuck, go on IRC, and, you know, people will help you, so don't, don't be afraid, and if, you know, if you're really interested, go to the sprints, and we can help you there as well, and if you, if you can help out, then Drupal 8 is just going to be even that much more helpful. So at this point, uh, I gave you the big picture of Drupal 7 and a preview of Drupal 8, if you have a question, they would like you to go up to the mic and talk into that and see if, or maybe I was crystal clear and no one asked them, which is good, right? Or everyone's asleep. Okay. I bet you're shocked that I was going to ask a question. No, I'm not really. <laughs> so as you know from yesterday, we're working in Drupal 6, and we were talking about the difference between node translation and field translation. Um, it was exciting to hear those differences, but when you said that going to Drupal 8 is going to be all field translation, that scared me a little bit because currently we source all of our uh, translations in English, including content that only exists in other languages. For example, we have Chinese-only products. We unpublish the English nodes, even though that's where we write the content, we send it out for translation, we get it back in. How on earth am I going to do that in Drupal 8? <laughs> Question. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm sure there's a way. <laughs> yeah, why don't we? Uh, I, I bet you you could find some people on Friday that might have a good method for you. Yes, so I'm just probably going to have to code it up. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I really encourage you to go to the sprints and sit on the multilingual table and ask that question. And I'm sure someone's going to. Oh yeah. That's great. Thanks. Oh, right? Okay. Yeah, hi. Um, so the stuff we've covered in this talk, and I want to speak in your talk, um, does it apply for like non-lingual languages like Chinese? And, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, um, you have to make sure that your theme supports, um, you know, if you're using like a right to left uh, language, you need to make sure that your theme supports that. So if you're doing a custom theme, you just need to do, you, there's a little extra work to have the right CSS files and things like that. But yeah. Okay. No, it's all, it's all supported. Can I go to Steve the second question? Are there any good buffs going on that you'd recommend? Uh, you missed them. They were yesterday. But, uh, you know, okay. I'll be around. I might hit the coder lounge later. So okay, thanks. feel free to come back. Hey, uh, I'm Kenny Kaligan. Um, just same question, but a little different. What, I mean, in general, what would you recommend whether we should go with node translation or field translation? migrating from Drupal 6 to Drupal 8 and not... Like oh, so you're in Drupal 6 and you're going to bypass 7? Yeah. Okay. That's our roadmap is like next year we'll uh, planning to go to... So it area. sounds like someone needs to write a migrate module, the plugins to migrate, that focuses on dealing with uh, that process. Because so what 
um, what, what do we do? I mean, normally, you know, normally you upgrade version to version, but right now I'm working on a site that's going from D5 to D7, so sometimes you end up skipping versions. Um, yeah, prob you're gonna, it's going to probably be some, you know, custom code using probably migration. You, you can't do it. You're not going to do a direct up upgrade if you're going from right, D6 to D8. But would following the node translation or in D6? Wait, are you, you mean you're building a site now in D6? There, I mean, oh, it's already still, there. We are still adding features to it, and, but it's in Drupal 6, right? Right, so you only have no translation in 6. That's a Drupal, yeah. So the entity translation is only from 7 and on. So, you, you, yeah, you're stuck where you are in 6, and then you'll have to, when, if you're going to upgrade to 8, right. you'll have to have some custom code that's massaging things and, and, and converting it from the multiple nodes to the single node. Now, the, um, um, the question previously was, well, we're doing something special about right. those, you know, those individual nodes, and I'm publishing some of them and whatever, and so you'll have to have, you know, he has kind of a different problem. Okay, uh, one more question on SEO config. You men mentioned about that. Any modules that you can recommend about that? Because we want to translate our metadata that we have on the nodes and all. You, you want to translate what? The metadata. Oh now. yeah, so yeah, so that's not a problem. So most of the standard SEO modules just have that built in. Um, you'll need to check, you know. So it's with a grain of salt. Just what you do is you go to the project page, go into the issue queue, do a search, and search for either I18N or multilingual, and then usually you'll find an issue that says, "Oh, make this I18N friendly or multilingual." So you know, make this support multilingual. And then just check the issue and see, was it resolved? Did they figure it out? Um, a lot of them are already handled. So like XML sitemaps, have, you know, is fine. And um, meta, meta tags. Um, yeah. We did run into a problem with meta tags, but I think it was because of panels. It was the integration of the two that we ran into some problems. But, but most of them are, are, by now, because Drupal 7 has been out for so long, that they support it pretty well. My website is a community site, so all the content is actually, actually created by the members and users of the site. We're not, you know, doing, taking care of translations or anything. We don't have any, we're not multilingual at all right now, but we're about to build a new Drupal 7 site. So I wonder if you have suggestions about either workflow flow or specific third-party tools or modules that might allow uh, members to propose translations of other members' content. You know, I imagine there's going to be some permission issues and things like that, but I want people to be able to say, I love this article, and so I want to translate it into Spanish so more people can see it, but then what if there are competing translations, and I don't know what else the other issues Right, kind of crowdsourcing translations, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I thought there might be a third-party service that does that, and that might, you might be able to sort of plug it in or connect it, connect to okay. it. Okay, so... The Lingo Tech guys say that they they do support the, the that model, uh -huh. so you might come talk to these guys. Um, yeah, I mean, if you just want them all on the site and don't want to use third party service, eh, that might be a little tricky, right? Probably you'd have to give them all a certain permission and maybe have some flags, like you know, like they get to flag their, you know, up thumb down thumb the translation, right, exactly. right, that kind of thing. Because if it's a field translation, they're editing the original authors. Yeah, yeah I'd recommend a third party. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, talk to these guys. Um, I'm not sure about the cloud words. Uh, I know that they plug into different systems if they have an idea. But um, yeah, okay, that'll be fun. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So we're currently using the D6 system right now. We have six different languages. My upper level management wants another language added. So now we have to take 5,000, 6,000 nodes, have them all translated, and add it at one time. Yeah. Um, so uh, are you doing your translation um, locally, or are you using a third party? No, so we're using a, a third party. So we're getting back the UTF 8 CSV file. So we exported all the data, and we're having to do it with feeds. I didn't know if there was a better way to do that. Um, it's yeah, in six, we're going to rebuild 
and seven, but then we're totally restructuring it to have different regional sites with different languages in each regional site. Uh, um, yeah, in six, yeah, the translation management tool processes, I mean, that's a seven thing. Um, it would probably take some work to pack port back to six, and I don't think anybody would be interested in doing that since six is, you know, end of life or whatever. But, um, yeah, maybe we'll talk after. I don't know. I have to, I have to chew on that one a little bit. All right, thank you. Sure. Hi there. Um, I just had a question regarding uh, fine-grained sort of uh, user permissions to translate a specific language, and whether you knew anything, if there's any modules for that, I guess. And then also, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I think actually, the, if you use translation management tool, I think it actually it'll let you say for each um, role or user which languages they can translate. Okay, great. Yeah. And then the other one with uh, with um, field translation. I was just wondering if there was any sort of uh, workflow in and around um, being able to approve a translation before it's sort of published, which I could see you doing. We've seen doing with the, the uh, content translation, the no translation with WordPress or something like that. But um, um, well, so that is that is built into the translation management tool as well. Yeah, so it's basically a workflow, and it lets you approve translations. Um, you're talking about having a, a something published and then. Than having something separate that's going through the translation process. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it handles that as well. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you. And uh, there's some email addresses um, on the slides if you have any more questions. If you can, go to the sprints. And I am a first time DrupalCon speaker. So I would really appreciate it if you gave me some feedback. Negative is fine. I'm okay with that. Uh, but just some feedback. So if you can go and um, you can just find the session in the schedule, and then there's a link that you can go and provide feedback. And DrupalCon, the association would be happy if you did that. I would be happy if you did that. Um, it just gives us a sense of, you know, who should be doing this down the road. So in that, I say thank you and have fun.